Chairman of the board, Mark Leahy. Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all. My name is Mark Leahy, and I'm the chairman of the board of directors of the Churchill Club. Uh, tonight's program is Venture Capital Round Roundtable Trends and Strategies 2009. Our sponsors are Cisco Systems, Fenwick and West, and Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, please join me in applauding them. Without their help, we wouldn't be able to have these type of events. <laughs> Our speakers tonight are Jay Hogue, Matt Murphy, and, and Reed Hoffman. And our discussion leader is Jeff Yang. Thank you much, gentlemen, for attending here. I'd like to mention two upcoming events. First, on Friday morning, March 20th, we offer a breakfast program entitled Capitalizing on the Billion Dollars in Energy Efficiency Opportunity, led by John Rockwell of Element Partners, with speakers from PG&E, Nth Power, Enernoc, and IBM. And second, on Tuesday, April 7th, we present a fireside chat about entrepreneurship with Ellen Musk, Elon Musk, a key force behind a key force behind uh, uh, notable companies PayPal, Tesla, and SpaceX. In conversation with respected journalist Michael Malone, we hope you can join us. Uh, for you who may not be familiar with the Churchill Club, we are the premier business and technology speaker forum here in Silicon Valley in the Bay Area. A nonprofit institution uniquely serving this community for over 23 years. Uh, we present about three high quality, highly relevant programs every month, and we currently have 6,000 members. If you're not a member and enjoy tonight's program, and uh, we hope you do, uh, please consider joining. Your support's meaningful, and we welcome your participation. Uh, it's easy to find us online at churchillclub.org. Now I'm pleased to introduce Jeff Yang. Jeff's distinguished career in venture capital sp spans 24 years. He is founding partner, uh, one of the founding partners of Red Point Ventures, a $2 billion family of early stage venture capital funds. In addition to Red Point, Jeff is a general partner with Institutional Venture Partners, also a $2 billion family of early stage venture capital funds, a firm he joined in 1987. Jeff works on media and infrastructure investments. He became a founding partner in TiVo, or founding, pardon me, investor in TiVo because he loves to watch TV. When pressed, he admits, admits he watches Damages, 24, CSI, Sports, and Family Guy. Uh, Jeff is going to kick off and guide the conversation this evening, but we expect him to contribute to the discussion personally as well. Let's give a very well, well, warm welcome to our returning speaker, Jeff Yang. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, when we were first discussing what the topic of the uh, tonight's evening should be, um, the, the title of Will the Hangover Never End uh, didn't quite make it, and so we decided to go to Venture Capital Roundtable Trends and Strategies. But uh, I think what we're going to try to spend, uh, we'll spend just about an hour talking a little bit about uh, a whole range of subjects, talking, talking about you know, the current environment and where the opportunities are, uh, what the outlook is, and then we'll kind of finish up with a little bit about what it's like to be in the venture business. Uh, I think, though, at some point at the end of the evening and when, when we take some questions, I'm hoping that maybe uh, I see Pitch Johnson here, who's really one of the, the, uh, the founding fathers of the venture capital industry. And, and 24 years ago, pretty much exactly uh, right around now, he was in his class at Stanford as a second year uh, taking uh, venture capital finance. So uh, I learned pretty much everything I learned, which isn't a lot, uh, from Pitch. And, uh, <laughs> 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 anyway. We're, uh, we're, really, we're really lucky to have uh, uh, this group here today. Uh, Matt Murphy, uh, partner Kleiner Perkins, uh, who is uh, it's responsible for many of their mobile investments. He runs the iFund, and he also has uh, worked on a whole bunch of infrastructure investments. And so he'll, he'll be kind of talking uh, a little bit of from the early stage venture capital perspective, as well as he'll talk a little bit about life sciences and the energy sector, if he would. Uh, Reed Hoffman, who is really one of the most uh, well-known and well-respected uh, angels in the valley, currently uh, chairman of LinkedIn, 
but uh, before that at PayPal and uh, at Intuit and, and, and other places. And um, uh, I remember meeting Reed on a Saturday uh, when LinkedIn was first getting started. It, he's working hard away, and it, it, was, it was just a, a remarkable place, and uh, I clearly wish that I were an investor in his company. Um, Jay Hogue, who is a founding partner of TCV, uh, a firm he founded in 1995. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, he had been a chancellor uh, capital management as a venture capital investor and as well a uh, limited partner in a lot, of these, uh, a lot of these funds. And Jay was one of our limited partners, a chancellor, when, he was, uh, when I was at IVP. And he was uh, one of the smartest and most fun uh, investors that we had. So uh, Jay will be uh, kind of representing uh, some of the, the later stage and some of the public perspective uh, of, of what's happening in venture capital. So with that in mind, maybe I thought I'd start by saying, uh, asking you guys to discuss a little bit of what the current environment is like. Uh, you know, from, uh, have you seen a downturn like this before in your years in the business? Is it, you know, some people say, well, you know, uh, it's not worse than 2001, 2002. Other people say it's the worst thing that they've ever seen. I mean, just kind of jump in and talk a little bit about, you know, what it's like and, and have you seen anything like this before? Well, Jay's seen maybe one or two more cycles than me, so we should start with him. I'll give it a shot. So, yeah, I, um, so I got in the investment business in 1982, really as the PC was being commercialized. And then the small cap market quickly went into a bear, bear market for small cap stocks for a couple of years. Crash of 87, Gulf War in 90. Um, now it's the internet uh, boom and bust. Uh, September 11th, you know, lots of uh, shocks over over uh, my career. This one, though, I guess is is, di is uh, different for a number of reasons. One is, I would say the um, you know the valley is not sort of epicenter for what happened. Um, right. You know, I think the credit markets were, but um, but you know when a when a it feels more like being sideswiped by a uh, tractor trailer than being run over by one. <laughs> um, but obviously what, what the chain of events has caused is, is, in my memory, the quickest and most severe downturn I've ever seen. Uh, so it's, it's different from that standpoint. And while in hindsight the federal government says we've been in a recession since uh, December of 07, I think the reality is the, the bottom fell out of the economy in September of 08. So we're still pretty early, right. early in this stuff. Um, and, you know, the risk premium went away in the credit markets, and as it started to come back, then I think people looked at all asset classes and said, well, maybe I should be compensated for risk. And so I think, you know, part of what's going on, uh, what happened last year in the public markets was simply that, uh, and it's working its way through the private markets as well. Mm -hmm. How about, how about you guys? Sure. So, you know, the, the fundamentals of this downturn are, are worse, but if you really look at the kind of this, the state that companies are in now. What happened back in 2000, 2001 is everybody overshot everything, both on the kind of supply side, venture uh, funded companies uh, expecting to go public in a year or two, not understanding their, their revenue models. You had uh, employees expecting very quick liquidity, all those kind of things. So it was a much more dramatic shock to the system. I think what we've seen in this environment is that companies were generally in better shape expectations were uh, a little bit more balanced and and while the shock came maybe as fast I don't think there were as many companies that were ill-equipped to kind of handle the adjustments that you have to go through in this environment so that's a big difference to me. I mean the only one I can really contrast with is 2000 2001 um, which is actually when I started doing my very first angel investments um, 2001 I guess the um, and so the issue I think that's different here is that then it was like, okay, well, there's a general downturn in the market, expectations in terms of liquidity, that sort of stuff, but there wasn't an uncertainty about, well, okay, are there massive shifts in revenue patterns? You know, will people be able to uh, spend or not? Will there be a lot of contraction in mm -hmm. terms of every dollar being looked at? Um, how deep will that go? Uh, will certain, you know, um, you know, will there be a number of companies uh, you knew there was a number of companies going out of business in the tech sector, right, where basically didn't have a business model, and you're like, okay, and, but you weren't thinking there were a bunch of companies that might be going out of business anyway, and so the characteristic of what's, and actually, I think one of the other differences is 2001 you know, was much harder on the valley than it was on the rest of the country, yeah. 
This is probably much harder on the rest of the country, but it's affecting us too. Right. So. No, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I often say that, you know, we were in the eye of the storm in 2001, and this year, this time we're on the periphery, but it's a much bigger storm. But the thing that really strikes me is in every other downturn I was thinking about that I've gone through, you know, whether it's uh, kind of 87 or the early 90s or, uh, you know, 2001, there were always other places that were still doing okay, and I still had, I always had the sense that it would come back. And if you look around the world, I mean, even in the Asia credit crisis, uh, y you know, there were other parts of the world that were doing, doing okay. What scares me about this one is that everybody in the world is, is doing poorly and that this could have, you know, very long-term ramifications. And, and one of the things I want to talk about later is when it, when it comes back, what does coming back mean? Uh, but I'm also very fearful that it could be a really long time. And so for the first time ever, it's really made me wonder about the uh, viability, uh, honestly, of some of the long term of some of the stuff th that, that our industry does. Uh, but I think at some point in the not too distant future, meaning a couple years, we're, I, th I think there's a scenario where we go all in. You know, we're, we're, in other words, if, there's a, if, if no IPO market, if an IPO market never comes back, our business is, is uh, largely toast. And, and at one point, you, you just have to bet that, you know, it's got to come back because if it's not, our business is not going to be, is not going to be around anyway. So what the heck, you know, we might as well, we might as well go all in. Did um, you, but think about 2000, 2001. I mean, it, did, it really didn't get better in two, the, until 2004. Yeah. Probably most firms, 2002, 2003, very few investments. We started to see more light in 2004, and then things got better progressively through 07, and then mid-08 started to tail off again. So that was still a fairly long time. Right. You think this is, that, even if we said three years, that's a lot longer than most people, I think, are out there are predicting that it'll take for it to snap back. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, you know, the, the, the weird thing is, I, I, think, um, I think the really bad part about what's going on, and the next thing I really want to talk about was this, kind of what's the obvious good news and what's the obvious right. bad news. And for me, the, uh, I'm sorry, the not so obvious good news and the not so obvious bad news. The not so obvious bad news is really that uh, there's no IPO market and there's an extremely limited liquidity market, you know, in terms of M&As uh, that are going on right now. And uh, in a strange way, I, th I think our companies are doing okay. And I, I, I actually am expecting, I, I exp I've been expecting worse performance out of our companies and right. our companies as a portfolio are doing okay. So. I guess the not obvious good news is I'm a little bit surprised, you know, by that. And the uh, not so obvious bad news is that um, that there's no liquidity, and I think that's the part that hurts us, you know, hurts us the most. I think the other piece of not so obvious good news is it's obviously a great time to be starting a company in terms of recruiting and the costs. And uh, and I still think there's money out there. Uh, we're we're and I'm sure you all are actively looking to put money to work. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think there's money out there. I think the cost is starting lower. The talent pool is much higher. And I think entrepreneurs I find are much more uh, amenable to thinking about low burn rates right now in, in the past where they haven't. But w what do you guys think? Uh, just take a slightly different angle on the IPO market. Um, you know, people, I think, sort of treat the IPO market as if it's its its own beast. And so last year was the lowest number of IPOs in recorded history, so that's not good, although, you know, they can't go much lower. Um, from, <laughs> <laughs> from nine, you start, you start over again. Um, but, you know, I happen, to, I happen to think that if we get stability in the public market, we don't have to get rallies in the public market, there will be an opportunity for companies to go public. And... You know, the, stat, the blow away stat to me around the volatility last year was, I believe the stat is from 1950 through the end of September of 08, there were 27 days where the S&P was up or down 5% or more. In the fourth quarter, there were also 27 days of volatility. And, you know, we continue to have a very volatile public market. So it's not, so, so to me, all you need is a, is a um, reduction in volatility where, again, most of the buy side can get back to looking at the businesses they own and looking at new businesses. And I think you'll have, you know, you won't have an IPO market reminiscent, obviously, the bubble or, or perhaps even, or even the 1980s. But I think the better companies will have an opportunity uh, to get public. Second comment on that, I think there were 2,000 private technology companies that received private funding last year. And I think our business is always one where 
there aren't 2,000 companies that perhaps should have gotten funding. And so you'll, you know, you'll have a very small number of big winners. You'll have lots of companies probably that lose. And that's, you know, that's okay. Um, I don't think that that's necessary. You know, Darwin does have, have its effect on our mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's always interesting in these conversations is we're actually all in the business of, and differentially, but all in the business of longer time frames. So, um, you know, one of the things that I was mulling about with a few early stage venture guys about a year ago was that my average number of years to liquidity as an angel investor is about seven, right? That's seven years out in the future from where you are now. Right. And so overly predicting based on what the market is this year for what's going to be going on seven years strikes me as something of a fool's game. Right. Right. And so, and, and now for, you know, you guys are the, more of the early stage venture, but, you know, what I hear frequently from a Series A to liquidity is like five to seven years when I, when I poll folks, you know, like, you know, what, you know, what, 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 when does Series A end up in liquidity? And, you know, there was obviously some aberrations around the whole, you know, internet bubble run up and, you know, a few other things. But um, I actually think that the current market has very little to do with what you're planning on other than intermediate rounds of capital right. and questions of appropriate valuation. Right. Right. Um, now, that being said, I think a lot of people uh, are being much more careful both in the angel side and also from what I can see in the early stage venture side of doing investing because they're worried about what follow on capital looks like. Mm -hmm. Right. Because angel investors basically never get the company to profitability themselves or in very, very rare circumstances. So follow on investment is mandatory. And the question is what the belief in the follow on investment is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, the not so obvious um, good news that you asked about is why, you know, why are companies seemingly doing better this time around? And I think every, every venture guy out there feels like, or person feels like, their portfolio is better than you would think. And I think we're all waiting for the other shoe to drop. But so far, I think it has to do with, uh, it was easier to rationalize what they were doing. And you didn't have such a saturated buying environment. And on top of that, in the consumer facing sector, uh, Google wasn't around back then. So now we've got much better monetization. Uh, and on top of that, you've seen things like virtual goods and a company like Zynga that we're involved in create a whole new form of monetization that didn't exist before. So consumer seems to be holding strong, kind of direct to consumer stuff. And it just hasn't got as bad as we would thought, given the overall economy in infrastructure type investments. Mm -hmm. I think now is a great time to start a company because if you can raise money, not only the, just the things you were saying earlier, raising money is a little harder, but it gives you a much better runway to go places. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, we just just talk for a minute uh, about what's happening in the angel world, and and are are the angels as individuals? Obviously, everybody's gotten hurt by this market. Are they pulling back, uh, or you you mentioned one of the other one of the other reasons you might pull back that's harder to get leverage on subsequent finance. I mean, what's happening in that market? And before you answer Sorry. that, I mean, looking at 2000 2001, they all went away. Yeah. Right. 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 Is it different this time? Um, I don't think it's a lot different. I mean, so I think there are two issues that hit general angel investors. Now, if I wasn't busy at LinkedIn, I would actually be hunting for investing a lot right now, personally, because uh, I actually did a lot of my uh, angel, the, the bulk of my angel investing I did between 2002 and 2004, because I actually strongly believe in the kind of the Warren Buffett line of the time to actually get greedy is when other people are heading for the hills. Right. And, you know, the earlier point that I made about time frames. Now, uh, given that I'm busier than ever at kind of a full-time job at LinkedIn, that makes it personally a little bit more complicated. Now, what I do think is actually happening with the angel market, from what I can tell, is two things. One is a lot of angel investors tend to only like to invest when they feel like they're playing with kind of house money or flush cash. And when their portfolios go down, all of a sudden the amount of budget that they have towards angel investing kind of dries up, so they just don't literally have anything in the kind of the budget anymore. Uh, and that's, I think to some degree just irrational because it's kind of a question of, look, are you right. doing it professionally or not? But it does happen. It's there. It's not, you know, one way or the other. The second is, and this one's the one that's harder to call, is angel, the way the angel investing works as an ecosystem is an expectation of, for the successful companies of later follow on by venture. Right. And if you think the venture market is drawing up and being much slower and more restrictive and everything else, then you're much more careful about what you invested because that 
cycle doesn't work as well. And isn't it also predicated on those kind of $20 million acquisitions where you get out quick at a 5X from Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, and that ecosystem has dried up a lot? The, the people that have actually pursued, I always thought that was kind of a silly market to pursue personally, and maybe I should be, you know, I'm trying to represent angel investors, and I guess some people like that. I mean, I actually believe the dictum that, that, that I think all of us believe, which is, you generally only invest in things that can be big because if it doesn't have the opportunity to be big, it completely changes your, your return curve. Because right, right. even though Google will buy some stuff at 20, it's not like it buys a thousand companies at 20. Right. No, <laughs> right. No, it buys no. like 10. Yeah. Right. So, so the issue always has to be is play to, to, to be really long. Now, I think that a lot of the, um, the angel uh, question is kind of like, well, okay, well, is it going to work or am I just going to... Because they were always, angel investors always think, okay, I put in, you know, 50, 100K, 200K, 300K, whatever it is, and then it converts into something. Right. But have the company go immediately from that financing to out of business yeah. is, is kind of painful, and that is heavily dependent on, on additional finance. So, you know, so one of the things uh, before we leave this topic, at least on the internet sector, you know, uh, angels, I think, have uh, played a really uh, uh, a valuable role in, in a lot of these internet deals when it's just just raw idea, right? And and a lot of a lot of venture firms uh, will say, you know, I kind of want to see some evidence of traction. And one of the great things about internet businesses is on a few hundred thousand dollars, you can kind of get a side up and get some initial uh, indications of how much interest there are, either viral or or, or what have you. And and you know, I think in this market, it's kind of hard to take on a bunch of these projects with no a priori sense of is, it, is, it, is there going to be traction or not, particularly in some of the most interesting segments. And if the uh, angels stop doing that kind of stuff, do you worry that, well, first, do you think angels will stop doing that stuff? Yes, if I think so, they're doing it a lot less. So, so, then, so then what? I mean, it, it doesn't mean that we venture capitalists have to write more you know, uh, $350,000, $500,000 checks and just take a bet, or do you think people bootstrap it more or, or the companies won't get started? Uh, probably a little of all three. But it seems like the Angel's a little bit more institutional this time around because you've got, you know, uh, first round, you've got Baseline, Andreessen yeah. and Horowitz are out there raising their funds, yeah. Sequoia just investing in Y Combinator. How does that change all that? Well, so I think the question, and now a lot of those have been going for a few years now, and then there's also like SoftTech VC and a few others. The um, the question will be is, do those models work and how do they get to the next funds? Um, I don't know if that, uh, it'll be interesting to see, that's an interesting question, whether or not that sustains kind of enough of the angel stuff that's a good feeder venture system. And I don't know if it'll play out that way. Um, uh, I've worked with a number of those funds and I think that that's a good idea, although I tend to be more, the thesis that tends to say, oh, now you should do $50 million funds as opposed to $400 million funds is not a thesis I agree with. Um, but actually, as, a, as trying to do early stage and feeder stuff, it might work out. Okay. Do you have to just expand on the uh, maybe not so obvious positives yeah. going on? Just expand on the, you know, I think one of the issues, certainly in the growth equity space, that caused um, excess in as 06 unfolded, 07, is just massive flow of money. And um, I can't speak to the, you know, early stage side, but I actually think the seeds of the recovery start being planted as people retreat. So angel funding being down, SPACs, which accounted for 25% of IPO volume in 07, gone. I hope I'm not... What's a SPAC? Maybe, you know, uh, sp special purpose acquisition company. So you raise money publicly and subsequently go out and identify a private company to buy um, upon which you actually put enormous dilution due to management options. but. Um, it was a concept I didn't totally get, but maybe there were some that were successful. Uh, hedge funds getting into the private marketplace, uh, and obviously, you know, they're, they're re most of them are retrenching to what is their core and trying to defend their core. You know, bio guys trying to get into growth equity, and, and so from a re for returns to be generated, as all, the, all that money goes away, I think the return opportunity goes up significantly. And for us as well, I don't mean to sound too much of a commercial, but a lack of a robust IPO market is also good right. news. You can do, you know, partial right. recaps, provide people with some liquidity. So, you know, and, and to, you know, quote um, Reed's friend Mr. Buffett, you know, pessimism 
is your friend and euphoria is your enemy. So right. it's, it's impossible to call a bottom, but right. as time goes on and the headlines are obviously uh, incredibly negative, right. uh, through, you know, through, through that there is opportunity, particularly right. as people start running scared. Right. Good point. Hey, let's, let's switch for a minute and talk a little bit about how the outlook has changed uh, your firm's strategies. Uh, you know, does it cause you to go earlier or later or private or public or talk, talk a little bit about that, you know, Matt? Yeah, well, I think there's more openness to be nimble in this environment. I mean, we all know valuations are compressed. Somebody I was sitting next to said that everything's a Series A right now, and I thought that was a funny comment. And it does kind of feel like that uh, right now, that, that there's almost... Uh, for, for any company that doesn't have kind of breakout traction, there's almost no floor to the price. And that's, uh, uh, that's an opportunity as a new investor and kind of scary uh, for your existing portfolio. But, you know, I think there's, there have been a number of companies in our portfolio that have done great financings in this environment and a number that have done tough financings. And you're seeing a bunch of stuff done around the table on the inside right now. And that's the easiest way to get something done right now. The problem is if the downturn is really protracted, you can only get one shot at that. It's hard to do two inside rounds. So that's when things could really get ugly for all these funded companies is if you don't get out the other side before that capital runs out. Uh, but I would say we're much more open to doing uh, late stage investing than we ever have before. We now have a fund in, in China. We have a green growth fund. Both of those are new. Uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, we invested in Zynga, which is a late stage investment that's gone through the roof, so we're probably even more encouraged after, after doing that. Um, but uh, in times like this, you basically have to um, be a little bit more open and opportunistic. I, I just want to amplify, yeah. just to, just to uh, amplify on something you said, but you know, one of the, the things about the current environment is I think it's really a market of haves and have nots. Yeah. And the people, the, the uh, companies that have traction or have real revenue or have, you know, EBITDA, they're actually getting uh, uh, value, uh, uh, getting money thrown at them, and many of them at, at very high valuations. On the other side, the ones that don't yet have traction or are losing a lot of money or high cap uh, burn rate uh, companies, those are the ones that are kind of hardest to raise money for. And, you know, my observation is that in um, the end of last year, uh, most of the companies that really could raise money easily did. Mm -hmm. And now we're entering the period of, I think, the companies that are, that are going to be having more trouble, that are going to have more trouble. This, this, isn't, uh, this is a ge vast generalization, but many of the companies that are going to have more trouble are going to, those are the ones in the, the, that we'll see what happens. Are they going to be inside rounds? Are they going to be significantly down rounds or recaps? Or are they just going to be yeah. well, uh, liquidations? Yeah. You know? Ca capital intensity right now is right. kind of a death knell. That's right. And that's the hardest area. Do you want to talk a little bit about the outlook and how it's changed your strategy? Um, so it hasn't really, I guess it's changed some tactics, but not really our strategy. Um, okay. I think, as you know, when we, when we set up shop, we want to be able to invest both in private and public companies. A crossover in our name is, is crossing over the IPO line. And the simple rationale for that is we thought we could generate returns doing it. Uh, and the rationale, under, rationale underlying that was, you know, as you look across technology, what you want to do is invest in the best companies. And at different points in time, that might be represented by a private company or perhaps in today's environment by a public company where, where the public values have declined very sharply. So we've always done that, um, you know, followed our companies in the public market and or, you know, done pipe transactions, right. what have you, in the public market. I think in today's world, um, we're tactically spending a lot more time on some public situations, um, you know, a few other stats. In the, in the NASDAQ, which I think is 2,300 companies, over 70, um, over 70 percent have market caps under 300 million, and the median of that group is like 70 million. So you, you have a lot of companies that are selling at cash value, uh, again reminiscent of the, of, uh, the bubble bursting, uh, and may, may have some interesting opportunities uh, for growth. So um, where I think the growth equity private market is adjusting from a valuation standpoint, but it's much more recent and it's not it's not moved nearly as sharply as, you know, the uh, NASDAQ decline last year of 41% and, and another, you know, high teens this year. So I guess that's a tactical shift, but not, yeah. not a strategic shift. Right. And from a stage standpoint, um, you know, we, we, uh, we kind of believe it's worth sticking to our knitting. It works for us. So sitting in between early stage, which we don't do, and the bio world, which we don't, you know, do much of, um, you know, there have been opportunities you can pass you by, and if you feel... In our case, if we feel it doesn't really fit uh, our core, we'll just let them go. 
Uh, maybe, Reed, before you talk about your perspective, I'll tell you, uh, from our perspective, um, you know, we've been historically kind of either really early or later, and we kind of avoid the middle is, is this, this, the, the strategy. I think in the current environment, we're going to continue to do this, the, you know, the Series A's because, as you point out, Reed, it's really not for what's going to be happening in the market a year from now, right. two years from now. It's really, you know, what is the market five years from now or six years from now, or however, however period of time. Uh, we're also doing uh, uh, series uh, B's or C's that are priced more like series A primes or, or things like that because um, in the past we hadn't done those because the valuations were, were too lofty. At this point, if you can get them at, you know, something, at an A prime kind of price, you know, it kind of makes sense to do that. And then the last is we've been very active on later stage. Uh, we raised a, a growth fund and we've made a number of private co uh, public company investments actually, uh, but we're uh, we're not trading buys, they're really more control-like influence buys where we go on the board and we, we plan to have long holding periods, but I actually think some of the best values are in the public market because of the, some of the stats that you were, yeah. you were talking about. Reed, you want, can you say something about what's happening? Well, so from what I can see, I think that um, generally speaking, I think angels are doing a lot less for the two reasons I mentioned before. Um, as I said, my general view would be is actually this would be a time to do more, <laughs> right, um, right, than less, or you know, growing into a time to do more, uh, which I'm not doing personally because of being very busy at LinkedIn. But uh, I don't think, I mean, th there may be. I haven't heard of any angels kind of going on. Oh, okay, now I'm doing public market deals. Although I think a lot of people are talking about the points you mentioned earlier, which is you look at the public market valuations and you go, wow, at some point this is attractive. <laughs> right, I should be doing that. Um, obviously, the whole problem is how far does the panic drive it down, and when does that get to be a good idea in terms of what to do? But uh, I haven't seen notable, other than general restraint, I haven't seen notable changes in strategy or kind of what people are doing. I guess a, a common refrain is a lot more early discussion of, you know, what does revenue look like and where do right. you get there? Right, right. So let's talk a little bit about activity levels and and, and industries, if we can, for a minute. Um, just to set the stage, uh, I'd be interested how many investments you all, each of you made last year as a firm um, um, and, and then what you think you'll do this year. It's just a measure of what the activity level was last year and what you think the activity level might be this year. Yeah, I mean, you know, across the, the three practices, not counting green growth or our China fund, uh, across the three practices, life science, green tech, and IT, digital, it's probably in the 20s. Uh, and that, that was last year? Yeah, mm -hmm. and last year I would expect it to be, you know, uh, more than half that, but... Uh, Sorry, th th this year you think it'll be... Uh, about half, more than half. Okay. But not 25%, not you know, not, okay. not way down. But la last year was a, a fairly active year as we ramped up our green, green practice. Sure. Yeah, I keep kind of being amused thinking of myself as a firm, but um, the... Uh, <laughs> I think really, I really more as an yeah. adjective versus a noun. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think I did eight deals last year, and if I were, if I had the time, I would do more than that this year. Uh, I think I'll probably end up doing two or three um, as a guest, but that'll entirely depend on time. Got it. Yeah, it might not be a complicated answer. So w typically, we're investing in six to ten companies a year, new, new deals, not follow-on transactions. Right. Um, so our, you know kind of big bets, big check sizes. Uh, last year we did four. Yep. Um, this year of that variety, I would expect a similar number, but there may be also some public situations that are a little yep. bit smaller, so mm -hmm. um, similar. And, and I think we did seven last year and we've done four, we've made four commitments so far year to date. My guess is we end up doing uh, about 14 to 16 this year. So, I mean, I think we'll end up being much more active this is it, year. Is that impacting year. your golf game? Well, I don't know. <laughs> at the margin. Um, can we talk a little bit about uh, what areas are, are the most affected uh, right now uh, or types of companies that are most effective? And then, and then let's talk a little bit about the industries. So, so Matt, you said, you said a few minutes ago that the companies that the highest 
uh, uh, burn, burn rates yeah. were really the hardest right. ones to raise money for. Does that mean you're not you're investing less and in, or you think people yeah. are investing less in, in companies like that? And, I, I really, and what else is like sure. that? I really meant that around the kind of digital and IT areas, which is kind of a more some of a more mature investment segment relative to say say green tech. So certainly there are a lot of very capital intensive green tech companies uh, in our portfolio that that still seem to be able to do astonishingly large financings at good prices, but and same thing on our life sciences side, but I guess if you've got a cure for cancer or uh, something that can replace oil, especially with the Obama stimulus coming, that those are still kind of concepts that investors really buy into. If you think about what's the next potential multi-billion dollar IPO, I think it's easier to get your arms around that as an investor than the next uh, IT or digital investment right now. E even if they're burning a lot, of, they need to burn... You know, you know thing, $500 million yeah. in capital would get there? The things that have suffered are things where you need to build a plant to remove technical right. risk and things like that. So I think what people are now trying to do is figure out, you know, in these capital intensive areas, how can you make sure that the technology works before you ramp up the spend? And I think before uh, uh, the cash was, was flowing, it was easier just to say, well, well, we'll just do those kind of things in parallel. So that's kind of the discipline that it's introduced. And I'm not saying that, uh, you know, there's now what, 40-something solar companies, and that, that has to get rationalized, but as long as you've chosen the good ones, I think they'll continue to be able to get financed reasonably well because the promise is so big. So in the area I do, which is consumer and stuff, um, generally speaking, I think the rational strategy is actually to go for distribution and traction and then work out details of the business model as you're going, because one of the things, if you try to solve all the problems at the same time, that's usually a recipe for solving none of them. And by distribution and traction? Millions of users. Is, uh, so, so something that right. is getting a yeah. lot of traction yeah. right yeah. now. Like the, the game that Twitter is playing right now. Right. right which is, sure. you know, let, let's care about millions to tens of millions of people. Let's care about them using it a lot. And let's have ideas about what we're doing mm -hmm. on economics, but let's, right. you know, treat that as a phase two. And uh, I still think that's the rational thing to do, but I think that a lot of people are now kind of going, well, I'd like to see the business model present and active right now. And I, my guess is that will actually create less interesting consumer internet things. I think the issue is usually how do you spread to millions first? But I think a lot more, I mean, I'm hearing a lot more of the question of, well, if I don't understand, like I, I don't want advertising as an answer, or generic advertising. If I don't understand the exact business model, then I'm not interested. Whereas before, it's like, well, right. if, it's, if it's really going up like that, then we have some ability to play with the business model. Right. Right. So. Yeah. I guess I um, so on the, we tend not to invest in capital-intensive businesses. Um, so that, but that is one swath where I think capital is much more expensive, and so I assume there'll be some that won't get it, and therefore will shut down. Uh, two other, you know, areas that in a downturn seems to get more, more headline then therefore having a harder time getting funding. One where there are large, well-managed um, market share leaders, so e-commerce, Amazon, um, which is interesting because obviously Amazon's been president as a competitor, you know, th through the uh, strong times, but people tend to only focus on a downturn, you know, or Google or Cisco. So I think that's much more in investors' minds. Uh, and then the other is, you know, kind of by vertical. So financial services vertical is an example. There are some businesses um, that were catering to the hedge fund community, which are under big pressure. Others that are more trading oriented, uh, volume related, who are doing quite well. Um, but I think as a, uh, the financial vertical had been a huge uh, boom of spend. And I think that's given all that's going on. The financial system has changed. And, and so a lot of those businesses may be more challenged. Mm -hmm. Okay. L let's talk for a minute about the different sectors. and, and um, uh, what, so, Reed, start for a minute and talk about what you think the prospects are for, for Internet companies generally, and then what areas are you most interested in? Uh, so, let's see. Uh, I think that, I mean, one of the things, obviously, is that the cost of starting and getting going on an Internet company is substantially lower than it was, you know, even five years ago and certainly much lower than ten years ago. And so I think there's still a wide variety of interesting option. Um, now, and that's I, because the infrastructure is better and, and on demand is, is it's cheaper yeah. and yeah. just everything. Right. And 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 part of what makes the internet interesting is it's one of the few places where you can actually get something going and start getting some distribution traction, including up to millions of people on relatively low dollars. Like how much? 
well, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, I think you can probably get something interesting going between 100 and 250K. 500 is a safe number. Yeah, okay. okay. Right. So, um, and, uh, and so I, you know, while there's been a whole bunch of stuff started, so getting above the noise more recently is harder and a kind of interesting challenge. It's harder now than it was in 2003 and 2004 just because of the volume of things out there all right. trying to get a share of uh, individuals' attentions. Um, I think it's still doable. Now, I think what, you know, part of, um, you know, where I'm, the areas where I'm kind of interested in personally um, have some overlap with LinkedIn, so I don't really do much investing in those, but it's Enterprise 2.0, software as a service, but also I actually think ad networks is an area that I think is interesting. Um, ad networks as a distribution? New kind, well actually, I, what I'm interested in is new iterations in terms of what is what do ads look like or run as. Um, you know, the kind of classic thing that people say in public stages as opposed to giving away things they're looking at or investment thesis or things like, well, you know, like behavioral targeting across, you know, ad networks of multiple right. services. There's a lot of people are trying to do that. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, the question is, are there other ways of doing it? Now, um, I do think that there's still a ton to be done in terms of new kinds of uh, entertainment. So, for example, when I uh, looked at the Facebook platform, I went, oh, this is going to be a really interesting thing for gaming. Uh, which is one of the reasons why I invested in Zynga, you know, um, Matt and his firm did as well, um, as a way of, I still think there's a lot more kind of new patterns of entertainment coming. Yep. Um, and the right structure of that, I think, would be interesting as well. You guys want to um, talk, talk a little bit about what, 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 in, what areas? Sure. Uh, yeah, well, sure. So on the kind of digital IT side, there's a lot of platforms emerging. So. We talked about Facebook and goes without saying the iPhone with 500 million downloads uh, in seven months of, of applications. But it's more than about the iPhone, but what the iPhone has now done to all the carriers around the world. I mean, we know that uh, BlackBerry's launching an app store. Android obviously has one, Nokia. So one of the biggest changes we see going on right now is in mobile. It's been coming for a long time, but finally, undeniably, that carrier control is loosening and there's going to be a lot more consumer choice developers and so that whole platform and ecosystem is going to uh, uh, you know, progress at 10x what it has over the previous set of years. Um, on, the, on the life sciences side, this whole move to personalized medicine and so we've got companies like Genomic Health and, and Navigenics and so you know, in, in environments like this, healthcare is still relatively cyclically neutral and if you can really be finding uh, things that help people get treated better or, prevent, or are preventative uh, and those, those things tend to be much more capital efficient than new drug discovery and things like that. And then we already talked a bit about green tech as an area just with uh, uh, on its own rights, but also with Obama and the stimulus plan, we we're very optimistic about some of uh, the programs there and how those are going to turn out. You want to talk about energy at all? Well, that's what I meant by you know, yeah, okay. uh, green, green tech. I mean, within energy, uh, you know, we're, uh, we've got uh, solar investments, we've got uh, some, um, you know, uh, a set of you know, bio, biofuels, things like things like that. Uh, but we've got we're up to something like 40 uh, green tech investments right now. Everything from recycling tires to uh, you name it, uh, wind. So uh, we're we're very optimistic and, and long on the sector. Invest in wind, um, Jay. Uh, you know, we, we're looking for anywhere that has certain revenue size and growth, and so. Companies that are growing in this environment, consumer and internet businesses, e-commerce, software as a service, some actually fairly low-tech payments uh, businesses. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, on our side, we're uh, I guess that the themes are you know one is the the, uh, the, the social web, if you will, you know, uh, kind of some next generation content, content creation, uh, activity, an activity web uh, where you're actually going and doing stuff uh, with other people. Uh, whether it's gaming or whether it's just hanging out or it's shopping, uh, and and social commerce we think is uh, uh, is is important. Uh, so it's the concept of you know going to the mall. You don't necessarily go to the mall because you need something with your friends. You go to hang out with your friends, and that 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 nature of the activity is as important as the activity itself. And so I think that that's a that's a big theme for us. Um, we're also spending a lot of time on next generation ad targeting uh, technologies. You know, I think you go through these cycles where uh, in, um, impressions are valuable, 
because there's nothing out there and then you get flooded and then they're not valuable and then someone figures a way to target the impression, all of a sudden imp impressions become valuable again and it goes through all these cycles and I think we're right now at a cycle where there's a glut of impressions, particularly from these social networks that are generating billions upon billions of impressions that are generally untargeted and once people find new ways of doing a better job targeting that isn't intrusive and isn't uh, um, repugnant to the users, I think, you know, inventory becomes valuable again. Uh, video and video uh, online usage is a big area that we're looking at and trying to improve that, those areas. Uh, and also using uh, the, uh, the internet for new distribution promotions for uh, the old content models that have been uh, destroyed, I guess, in terms of the music side and, and on, the, on the video side, we think is, uh, is really interesting. Um, on the, we do do some uh, uh, clean tech stuff and I think um, on the demand management side, we spent a lot of time looking at supply and how to produce uh, new types of energy more efficiently. I think the next generation of the demand, controlling the demand side either by moderating uh, uh, energy waste or, or producing energy in off cycles is, is really an interesting area. And then storage is, is obviously a big area that has not yet been served. And then lastly on the Enterprise 2.0 stuff that Reed was talking about, a uh, whole virtualization uh, and then on demand both in terms of infrastructure and applications is, is a big trend. And, and lastly, interestingly enough, uh, we had made a lot of uh, mobile bets um, uh, over the last few years and I guess in the last two years we had, we've been leaning back a little bit and we're, I think we're, we're, our inclination now is to lean forward again because it's, you know, it seems like things are really starting to evolve and change again. Right. So. Um, Let's, let's talk for a minute uh, about um, uh, just shifting hats uh, for a minute and, and talk a little bit about, you know, for people out here who are running companies, um, what advice would you have uh, for them uh, either in terms of, you know, what they should do in terms of investing or their, their burn rates or raising money? Well, I think... <laughs> The standard uh, advice that, you know, kind of started last quarter was, you know, uh, make sure you have a plan. If you're not profitable, make sure you have a plan that gets you to profitability with a uh, or reasonably good cushion in the bank. If you don't have that, raise as much money as you can in order to have that, in order to make it happen. Um, Would you raise money before you need it or, ra or, or I'd raise, raise money, money if you had a relatively easy way of getting it. As long as, I mean, if you're profitable, then you can put off that question or if you have enough cushion. But if you don't, uh, there's still enough uncertainty in terms of what's coming in the future uh, in order to do that. I mean, one of the things that, you know, uh, LinkedIn, we're planning on a still another substantial growth year. Um, but we're carefully, manage, you know, monitoring metrics to make sure that, you know, just the weirdnesses of being in 2009, <laughs> right, don't suddenly throw something off. Right. Um, and so uh, I think that the, the way to digest, um, you know, uh, the, the, the question of, you know, what, what, how, do you, how do you prepare for very turbulent and uncertain times is watch carefully, monitor, and then make sure you have some scenario planning, including how do I get to profitability, presuming capital is extremely hard to raise, presuming that revenue might be decreasing because the people who are paying you revenue may be much tighter about it, et cetera. And that's, that's still, I think, a generally wise pattern. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it necessarily means that. I mean, and, and, you know, uh, LinkedIn's doing well. A number of my portfolio companies are doing well. Or all the portfolio companies, I think, are doing well. It doesn't mean that disaster is coming. Just, you know, be very attuned to if the circumstances turn down. I think, I, I don't know if you're asking the question for a new entrepreneurs starting, but I do think that it's good in this cycle, at least right now, based on what we talked about earlier, the number of institutionalized angels out there actually makes that capital still fairly available. But what I would say is that we're going to have to be more in a mode now where people are going to have to form companies and do it uh, kind of the old-fashioned way without taking salaries and get to a certain point before they require any capital. And Reed can probably talk to this better than, than me, but I think if the angels disappeared, then it creates this huge vacuum in the market, whereas if venture guys are kind of upping their bars a bit and the angels aren't gone, then how do you get between here and there? I think it's good that the angels are still there. I think that's still a real there. issue. What's that? Yeah. I think that's going to become a real issue. Yeah, but probably not <coughs> right now, but it can happen pretty quickly. So anyway, the fact that angels are still there, but still then the angels bar is going to be higher, so I think it's going to be a lot more 
do as much as you can or more on as little as possible because everyone's going to be asking you to. I guess my answer, it, it depends on stage of company. I think, you know, if you're cash flow negative and playing defense and uh, having a plan to, to conserve cash makes sense. I also think, though, this, op this environment creates opportunity and in some of our more substantial companies, we're, we're, you know, we're going on the offensive in terms of other tuck-in acquisitions that can add substantial amounts to either the technology platform or, you know, or the revenue side. And I think that that, you know, so, so you can gain major share and then when there's a significant rebound, you're, you're uh, I think we're going to see a lot more M&A activity this year as people have adjusted to new, uh, you know, one of the things I hear is everybody's trying to figure out how to get enough critical mass yeah. so that the business model starts working, right? What, and, yeah. and so the question is, do you think you're going to see a lot more uh, M&A as people get, now get comfortable with their valuations or, or, or Yeah, so part of it, I think, depends, goes back to my issue on volatility relative to the IPO market. It's impacting the M&A market, too. Yeah. If you're, you know, if you're a public company and, you know, one day your stock's at 10 and the next day your stock's at 20, you're not sure what what current, you know, what the value of the currency is you're using. Uh, so if we get stability, I think absolutely. Although I don't think, you know, the, the uh, M&A numbers are so, were so driven by the buyout dollars and the really large transactions that the published numbers you you won't necessarily see an increase in, in M&A activity because a lot of the deals are just, you know, are 20, 30 million dollar deals, not not the 50 billion dollar buyout of XYZ company. Yeah, well, we'll see more in M&A, but it's, it's going to be, and especially in certain sectors like digital IT, it's going to be painful because the valuations are so low. So as venture capitalists, you're going to be faced with, I can exit now, but the outcome's so right. low, I'd rather kind of keep playing the hand until the environment gets better. In other sectors like life sciences, you've got pharma companies alone with about $110 billion, and the way they usually grow their product line is through M&A. There were two IPOs last year in... Uh, in life sciences, 50 the year before, but M&A has stayed relatively flat. So that's at least one sector where M&A should, should hold up. You know, I, I've, I've been speculating uh, that um, uh, we're going to see more private to private M&A deals, which have historically been really hard to do. I'm just kind of curious if you guys think that. Seems like they're more suited for services businesses, like, you know, the Assurians and the Summits marking things up and things like that, but the kind of pure tech businesses that hasn't, hasn't really happened the way we expected. I think there might because of, but I think the pattern would be is generally, for example, companies with large cash reserves or profitability buying companies that are otherwise kind of fiscally on the ropes. Right. They may have interesting assets. I think that you'll see more of that kind of transaction happening. I think the challenge is when you have, for example, two companies, both of whom yeah. have reasonable prospects, when you're doing a private transaction, yeah, it's really a who gets what percentage yeah. of the commodity thing, and it, it's a zero-sum, you know, combination, and those deals are v always very hard to negotiate. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think logically it should happen, but I agree with you. Yeah. Um, Je hey. Jeff, one of, the, one of the things, and I don't know if the venture business will follow the path of the buyout business, but one of the strange things during the buyout boom was something like 25 percent of the transactions in the buyout world were simply companies changing buyout hands. Yeah. yeah. Their own economy, um, and so I don't. You know, it'd be interesting to see if, if, in fact, there is very little liquidity in the next couple of years, whether you start to see more of that happen. You know, uh, venture firm been involved in, in a company for 12 years, and um, you know, looking for liquidity. Fact, I'm, had I'm not sure it'd be good or bad. It just might be. A we've trend. actually had the la uh, a couple of our companies get offers from large private equity firms mm. to basically buy out some or all the company. Uh, at, at pretty interesting prices because a lot of these large private equity firms are sitting on large amounts of capital. Yeah. I don't know if that's going to it's going to be a trend or not. But hey, uh, w w uh, I'd like you all to start thinking about some uh, questions for Q and A. But I want to hit one other subject before we do that, and that's about you know the venture business uh, as uh, in and of itself. And and I'd like you to kind of just talk a little bit about what the venture business is like out there, particularly for venture capitalists who have to raise money themselves for their own funds, and whether that's going to create uh, a shakeout. Um, uh, in, everybody's for, for, I think, decades, people have talked about a shakeout, and uh, shakeouts never really happened in any meaningful way. Uh, but uh, I'm interested in if you think that, that w first describe what the fundraising environment is like out there as far as you hear. And then do you think a shakeout will happen? Sure. 
Well, everybody says it's terrible, and I, I, I think in the, it probably is in general, but for the top, I don't know, 10 or maybe 20 firms, it doesn't to be, seem to be such an issue right now. I know, for example, Excel went out and raised their $500 million growth fund in about a month. NEA just announced that they raised uh, $2 billion. So I think for those set of firms that have a long track record and produced returns, that's fine. I think outside of the top 20, uh, it's, it's a no man's land. And part of the shakeout will be based on where they all are in fundraising cycle. If you raised a fund a year or so ago, your kind of timing was fortuitous. You're lucky. And maybe you can invest slowly enough and kind of hang on long enough until things get better and you put a couple numbers on the board and then you can raise um, a round again. Uh, sorry, a, a fund again. But for anybody without proven returns or too bad funds going out in this environment, I think there's going to be a big shakeout. And I just don't know enough about where all these firms are in their fundraising cycles, except I do know that a lot of firms bulked up in 08, 07. So there is this risk that they extend the runway a long period of time and we don't bulked see Bulked up by, by raising big yeah, funds. Yeah, raising big funds because things were good for a couple of years. And, uh, LPs were optimistic and the funds got larger now. One of the other things you and I have talked about is what's the risk of defaults, and right. it's kind of urban legend right now. It's I just like heard, it's like cow. I know. I just heard, I just heard two yeah, two no more stories. Two more stories, stories today that yeah. uh, kind of some life sciences only funds are starting to see defaults, but I haven't been able to pin anybody down on who are the LPs that haven't really paid and have decided to walk away. So it's a lot of rumor, and I just don't think we've we've we, seen we actually it yet. heard one this morning yeah. uh, that, that that somebody had to decrease their investment amount in a new deal because one of their LPs defaulted on a capital commitment, but mm -hmm. it, it, up to date, it's still it's been largely urban legend. Yeah. Uh, um, I guess my take is I think that there should be a shakeout. Yeah. Um, and maybe I'm maybe I'm getting too too old, but um, that's that's true too. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'd observe in in '91 there was two billion dollars raised in total by the venture business. Now, obviously, the technology pie is much bigger than it was back in 1991. Um, but I don't know, you know, I think there was 30 billion raised in 07 and 26 billion in 08, um, not including probably angel capital and a, you know, a whole bunch of other pools of money. Um, and there's no way to prove there's too much or too little money, but it's still, it's a pretty big number. And one of the strange things in my mind that happened coming out of the bubble was that funds got replenished in 2003 yeah. and 2004 when, be, because of the long fund lives, you get to continue to chug along, and then for whatever reason, investors say, well, okay, so you had a terrible 99 fund and a terrible 2000 fund, I'll continue to give you money. Uh, that very few businesses actually, I think, have, have worked that way. Um, and so I think as we turn the clock in 2009, 2010, you're seeing vintage 99 and 2000 funds who didn't get back to break even and perhaps never will. Um, and I think there'll, you know, there'll be a, a weeding out process uh, whereby some folks won't get, you know, won't be able to raise new capital. So you think there will be a shakeout and we'll see, we'll see fewer firms? Yes. You know, there was a risk um, for a little while that, uh, that there was going to be a whole new set of capital out right. there from the Middle East. Right. And everyone started going to the Middle East and it looked like there was going to be a doubling of the potential capital sources. And that would exacerbate the problem of more funds and people lasting longer. But that door slammed right. hard about two months ago. So yeah. I don't think it's an I'd, issue. I'd add to the um, the state of the world in the endowment yeah. land, yeah. in some public pension funds, in some private pension funds, and many other pools of capital. It's it's tough. Um, mm -hmm. There have been you know major uh, elimination of of capital, and so if you just take, if you go beyond just venture, but you say all alternative assets, which had been very much in vogue in the last several years as people replicated certain endowment models, I think there's a decent chance that gets called in a significant question over the next several years. Um, and, you know, but, but also just the availability of capital, I think, is constrained. It's probably going to be more likely felt by the big buyout guys than a, you know, can you raise a three or $400 million venture fund? So I, I think that's definitely true. I mean, uh, right now, the endowments and the foundations are suffering major uh, liquidity squeeze, squeezes because they've got, typically they have uh, defined payout models where they pay out four or five percent, uh, you know, to programs. And when they're, uh, they're, they're 
uh, their base contracted considerably. They, they had a lot of liquidity issues, and so now endowments and foundations are really in a world of hurt trying to get liquidity to uh, meet their existing uh, commitments, and, and they've really scaled back on capital commitments. It seems like pension funds are still out there, but I think, you know, I've read some statistics about the nature of unfunded pension liabilities, you know, being in the trillions of dollars, and I think, you know, the next five years, that could be a really interesting, uh, uh, interesting state of affairs. And the sovereign wealth funds uh, in the Mi Middle East and in Asia uh, have all pulled back, you know, considerably. So yeah, it, it, should, it should be interesting. It's definitely introduced a new risk in our business, which is who right. are your co-investors? Right. Because right, you don't know who they've taken money from right. or if they're uh, a first-time fund. And we saw this back in the, late, in the late 90s, early 2000s, where all the strategic investors just suddenly disappeared. And you'd be in a syndicate and half the syndicate would go away. Right. And so you might have the same challenge with some co-investors. So one final question, and then we'll go to Q&A. Um, out of every crisis comes an opportunity. And so my question is, what opportunities arise out of this crisis? Well, I think the shorthand is a great time to start a company, and mo many of the biggest, strongest companies get fun, fun, uh, uh, started and financed in downturns. And while raising capital is harder, I think that the opportunity to you know, get talent, have a longer runway, less competition, et cetera, et cetera, is bigger. Mm -hmm. I think I already said it, so it'll be a little bit redundant, but I don't think there's been a time when you can look across as many sectors and be excited about where to invest. So, you know, with green tech, clean tech, everything going on in that environment, uh, in digital and IT, between everything moving into the cloud and all these new monetization sources that we talked about, virtual goods and all the platforms, the iPhone, Facebook, and then life sciences having its own revolution around personalized medicine. So yeah, it's a really hard time to get liquid, get public, raise money, but when have we had three such large opportunities in parallel? Mm -hmm. yeah. and I, I guess I'd just add that, that um, you are seeing, it's a small number, but a, a number of companies growing very nicely despite the most severe economic downturn. Um, and I heard Eric Schmidt speak the other day, he figures, well, if it can continue to grow and gain share and generate more cash and be more profitable when this thing turns around, that's a pretty good place to be. Uh, and you're, you're, you know, certainly in our sector, you're seeing uh, the best valuations you've seen in, in many, many, many right. years. So, so there obviously are risk, but I think for new investments in 2009, 2010, um, in a very pessimistic environment, it'll, it'll end up being really good vintage years. I actually, I actually agree with, with all of you, and, I, and I'll, I'll also add that I think one of the really interesting things is that in this downturn, it's really called into question some of the basic business models of some of the largest companies in, in this uh, country. And to the extent that their business models no longer work, but they provide a set of uh, goods and services that are still important to how people and companies live their lives, I think there's a real opportunity to, to really remake and really craft, you know, brand new business models out of this downturn because uh, some of these really large companies that have been around for generations and generations just aren't going to survive or aren't gonna, are going to be severely damaged. And I think that creates a lot of opportunity. Yeah. Um, I th thought maybe at this point we should take some questions and uh, there should be mics uh, over there, uh, the gentleman right here. Uh, Steve Bell with Pulsadec.com and I'd um, like to thank you for a great discussion. I have a question for the venture capitalists on the panel. I'm wondering is there anywhere we can go to observe the performance historically of venture capital funds? Um, there seems to be a little transparency problem and uh, as of April 08, if I'm correct, uh, they're filed electronically, the Form Ds, but they're no longer in the public domain. And um, I actually had an investigative reporter contact me this week inquiring about whether it's possible that the venture capital industry could become the next Bernie Madoff situation in two or three years. <laughs> Whenever I run into a VC at a conference, I know that's kind of a rough question, but they tell me there's really four or five consistently successful funds operating, and the rest of them, they say there's not enough deal flow of quality deals. Well, that, that, for all this that, money that, to chase. That's, that's kind of a different issue, which is that, that may be, that, that's true, I think, if you look at the industry where the concentration of returns are, that the top, you know, 10% of firms or whatever, I think, deliver 90% of the returns that spend that, that it's way It's very for, screwed, just like hedge for, funds, for right? For a that's, while. That's and, you know, I think, I think just through word of mouth, you can find out from people who those, who those set of firms are. I, I, I can't point you oh, anywhere yeah, I to, get, to get, uh, 
you know, publish data. And then in terms of it being a Ponzi scheme, I think they all have got, you know, all these companies have to report on real companies that they've invested in, have annual meetings with their LPs. So there's, there's actually a company there. So I don't, where, where do you go to get this data in the public domain? So there, there are actually um, most of the large public pensions funds, so Cal, CalSTRS, CalPERS, State of Washington, they, uh, they'll, post, they'll post IRR data on their websites. It usually lags about a quarter for Great. a lot of the funds that they're invested in. Um, it, it won't be the entire universe. It may, may you know, there may, not, may or may not be the highest quality, but uh, that data is out there. Okay, thank you. Um, and one question for Reed. Um, you mentioned Twitter, and I'm wondering if you see anything positive going on there, or what your analysis <laughs> would be of Twitter. Is it growing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, here it is. Um, well, I think if you're growing off the charts and you have some interesting prospects, I think it is very positive. Yes. Hi. Uh, I'm a freelance journalist in Silicon Valley, and uh, freelance not by design but by circumstance. <laughs> um, tomorrow, the Seattle Post Intelligencer prints its last dead tree edition, the Rocky Mountain News, Folded, Tribune Company, Hearst, et cetera, are all in distress. Um, Mr. Yang, you spoke just a moment ago about companies that have a valuable product but a failed business model. I wondered if you and the other panel would take a, a look at what would be a, a business model for media going forward. Well, I, I guess, so, so if you look at newspapers for a minute, um, I think that uh, there are very few papers, as I understand, in the country that make money on circulation. Uh, New York Times being probably, Wall Street Journal probably being two of the, the, the most notable. But there aren't that many that make money on circulation. Most of them make money on ads and mainly classifieds ads, uh, jobs, uh, jobs, autos, um, uh, real estate, uh, personals. And if you look at all those categories, the internet has just gone right after it and kind of skim, skim the cream on that. At the same time, the other side of the ledger, the newspaper costs have, have risen uh, substantially. Uh, paper, uh, printing, uh, a, a physical distribution have gone up and, and it's very hard to really raise your prices when in fact you're, you're not making money on circulation and you're trying to get as many people as you can. And so I think that business model as you point out is really, is really flawed. Um, I actually have spoken to many people in the newspaper business suggesting that maybe there was a different way uh, uh, because th they all complained about how expensive content creation was and that you know, needing, especially covering local. You know, local was, they had, had needing a lot of, you know, reporters and, 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 and things to cover that. And, and I was suggesting that, that maybe a, a model for content creation was to have, you know, professional editors, a few professional writers, uh, but also cr use a lot of user-generated content to kind of fill in, um, uh, to fill in, you know, the holes and have uh, basically the, the whole, um, uh, web sphere, you know, creating content for you, and, and uh, you know, my point was that I felt that uh, if someone came to a site to read an article, they weren't attributing a different value because one had been written by a professional a writer and then another had been uh, written by, uh, you know, a, 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 some other, you know, a, a user, and that um, uh, the Facebook and MySpace is kind of one of the largest and most uh, prolific examples of user-generated content. And people go there and they spend hours, you know, on that site. And so I think there is a, a model, and it's actually happening right now, that people are going to all these sites today, and these sites are selling advertising or they're selling leads. And, and I think that is the model. Um, uh, all the contents, uh, you know, I, I, would, uh, my sug I would suggest that at a minimum the people here are reading much uh, fewer newspapers, if, if at all. I know a lot of people just don't really, really read papers anymore. They just go to their websites and you can, you know, you can get RSS feeders. And in fact, I can even follow Reed on, on his Twitter and see, you know, what may, gets him, you know, interested. And I think, I think that transition has already happened. And I think it took the newspapers a while to kind of figure that out. But, you know, unfortunately, uh, um, I, I still think there are opportunities in that space, but I think that's, you know, that, that's a great example of, of an industry that, that, that that's been happening to. Yeah. My name is Georgia, and uh, I don't have a job. 
I have written down my question here, so I just read to, to you. Uh, I have four patents pending in U.S. Patent Office since 1999-2000 in Internet database areas. And then I'm the loser for four civil lawsuits in less than 11 years against uh, discrimination, cooperation, and uh, government corruptions. But the consequence is current global economic crisis. The VC's investment in, not a part in recent 10 years is basically a failure. My question is for VCs and for all the audience. Will the VC invest me or keep failing? I didn't understand the question. I, I, uh, can, you, can you phrase your question? Did, 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 no. I didn't uh, get another word. If I'm still frozen, everybody else will be frozen as well. So if you want to make progress, you have to invest me. When I can go for, move forward, everybody can. Otherwise, nobody can. The worst thing is the baby boomer retiring. I'm a baby boomer. The new worker come from South or US borders. So the situation is very serious. So this is a serious question for everybody, not just for VC. Uh, but I, uh, are you suggesting that we're not investing in new companies? Uh, I have been keep sending my business to, to VCs since 2000 to more than 200 VC firms in, in Bay Area here, multiple times. So every VC in Bay Area should get my business plan 20, 30 times, might be more. Please read my paper. Read my paper. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Do you have a question? Okay, hello, I'm Laura Nua. I am CEO of Family Link. And Family Link, what it does is a communication platform for seniors or desk tech able people to connect with their family members. But what I'm missing in like following the VC world, etc., is the excitement about offering technologies for aging population. Because it's coming to us, not only in the US, worldwide. And I see it as an unserved need myself. How do you look at it? Are you excited about it? What's your view? Is it an opportunity? I think there's always an issue of uh, technology adoption in that demographic, and that's probably the thing that, that worries many of us. I agree with you that it's uh, growing, going to get larger, and can be quite profitable. Uh, we've experimented a couple times in, in that area, and I think the technology adoption of the demographic is one that's become more of a challenge than we thought. And so for things like that, and oftentimes, you know, you're going to have to convince venture capitalists by proving that the model's scaling. You know, how do your single user economics work? Uh, how many of you sold? And then, then you can kind of get us over on how some things we're skeptical about. That's the tough part because it's not a typical consumer play. Like right. internet and technology are mainly, mostly made for younger people, and they are willing to try out but seniors are not. Right. Well, I, I mean, I, 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 think, I think the reality for, for all of us is that if, if you've got numbers that show that, you know, you're scaling and, and it's growing very rapidly, uh, I, I think ultimately that's going to be, you know, the proof in the pudding because I think we all know that, we, you know, we live in an aging, uh, an aging demographic, you know, here in the United States. And, I mean, you look at Jay as an example. And <laughs> no, 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 no. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm going to show you no, 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 I take it back. <laughs> show your butt. From, uh, um. No, but, um, but, 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 but there's no question that, the, you know, the, uh, the size of the market is growing. But I think the, the, que the, 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 the way to debunk, you know, all of our concerns about you know, the technology adoption and uh, these are the way, you know, they, the people will live their lives it, we know that 15 and 16 year olds are going to live their lives in a very connected fashion, right? And the question is, will, will um, uh, uh, the, the people that you're targeting, you know, is it a change of behavior or is it a natural extension of their behavior? And the way to debunk it is to show, you know, any analogies, okay? So if, you, if, if your own site is growing, you know, like crazy to say, hey, you know, here, here are the stats, and if they're not, then show other examples, anecdotes that say, that, 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 that show that, that, you know, that is in fact, you know, yeah. the case. And I'm on that topic, so we're investors in eHarmony, right. and the vast majority of their users are between 25 and 45, but the fastest growing is actually 45 to 60. Um, so it's not, you know, we're, we don't wake up saying let's not provide service to, right. uh, to a population if they're 
they're adopting. Right. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Sorry. <coughs> Hi, my name is Pamela Holliday. Um, I like the metric that you threw out that you think that for a lot of the, the digital and internet plays that you could actually try and get something going and to your point, Mr. Hoffman, get some distribution up to millions pretty quickly for like 500,000. But as early stage investors, what kind of revenue multipliers are you looking at? Not so much for your return on your investment, but as you're looking and evaluating the company, if someone brings you a business model and they say, well, yeah, I think if we spend 500,000, we can get to revenue of X, what makes sense to you based on what you've seen in the last six months? Because it doesn't sound like, given the number of companies you've invested in, that there's really a whole lot out there. So I'm wondering, what is the spectrum? When I invest, there's almost, has there ever been revenue in the company when I invest? <laughs> if so, you get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we don't, the question of revenue multipliers isn't usually the way that you set valuations. Uh, I actually don't know if any angel investor who thinks in those terms. It's more of a function of um, what, is, what is the view that is a fair investment price that will lead to the next uh, round of investment that will come from venture and other sources. And it's that spread more than a revenue multiplier. Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Eddie Maxinia. Yeah. Um, I have a different question, sort of a macro question. Um, I'm actually pretty bullish um, about what we do in the Valley. I'm an angel investor and an operating person. I'm very bearish about the U.S. as a whole. So I feel like um, we in the Valley have a lot of creative people. We create a lot of businesses. And actually, I think the venture business as a whole is amazing. We invest about 20 billion a year and create fundamentally competitive industries. Then I look at the rest of the U.S. and we're spending 20 billion in Detroit supporting a debt industry, we spend $180 billion on AIG. So my question is, you know, we as a state, can we carry the rest of the, rest of the U.S.? <laughs> can, we, can we continue to carry the, the larger entity and the growth of this economy having such a small, you know, center of innovation? And frankly, the only three things you can do as a country, you can manufacture, you can provide services, you can innovate. And our innovation engine is just too small. And I'm, I have that question for you guys, which sort of, and the reason I'm asking is because um, I sort of see the venture industry not being active enough within the leadership circle. You know, getting out there and saying enough is enough. I'm frankly tired of paying taxes and having it bail out. Will you run for Congress? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 but I, I, on a serious note, I mean, I'm, I'm right now, I, I'm, at, I'm on, the, on the venture side right now and at Trinity Ventures and my frustration is you're not taking full page ads on Wall Street Journal saying enough is enough. I mean, 180 billion to an industry that I can't see what the value creation engine is. I, I never understood why New York is viewed as a value creation engine, frankly. I mean, I, I'm baffled by it. <laughs> but, but, and I, I, I never gave my money to these guys to manage. So I'm like, I, I'm just wondering why we're not being more vocal about the fact that we are the innovation engine of this country. And 20 billion of innovation a year is not going to drive us out of this disaster. That, that's my feeling right now, so okay. I want to ask that question. Uh, I, re I wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post about a month ago uh, and did an interview on Charlie Rose and basically I'm strongly on the record of, 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 of using the fact that I think we do need stimulus, but using stimulus as, as borrow and invest as opposed to borrow and spend and figuring out how to do a lot more grassroots cross entrepreneurial investment. The, the biggest political problem is, is you know, banks and large industries and everything else have large political, both, you know, em, uh, employee, empl they, uh, cut, you know, like em a large place of employees and suppliers around them and political constituencies in Washington. So part of the reason why I think you, we have to get out there and make the voice more known is to support that that doesn't have a political constituency. So I, I guess I'm largely in agreement. But, but I, I also think that there are a lot of technology executives and at least I believe one of Matt's partners who are spending a lot more time uh, that, that probably have more access than in, in any prior period to this administration. Yeah. That would be a separate issue around are you concerned about the amount of spending and is it, is it, uh, is it money well spent? But well, this is also part of what TechNet's supposed to be doing and I guess what the National Venture Capital Association is supposed to be doing. But Yeah. Maybe as a piggyback to this, uh, 
A quick question about uh, the policy for uh, foreign employees, and I think we, you were involved in this as well. And part of the stimulus package, uh, there's been a, a quote that says that the, some of the banks that got the stimulus money cannot employ foreign workers on H-1B. I would appreciate your comments on what do you think uh, is the part of foreign employees to the Silicon Valley and to high tech in general, and what do you think should be done as a social investors as well? Well, so what I said in the Washington Post article is remove all caps on H-1Bs and just add a payroll tax, let the market deal with it. But, mm -hmm. And we're a country founded on entrepreneurship and immigration, and we should encourage as much of it as we can. Yeah. I agree. So. This is aimed at uh, Matt and Reed. My name is Andres Perionis. I established Holgen Tech for a genome-based economy. We advocated this in a Churchill Club event about four weeks ago. Since that time, something interesting happened. About a week ago, Sergey Brin turned out to be an angel for uh, uh, a cooperation between Google, Parkinson Institute, and 23andMe for personalized medicine, trying to prevent his condition because he's predisposed for Parkinson's. He has time, about 20 or 30 years, and some money, and he's going for it. So do you see, both of you, as a new sector emerging, which may be called venture philanthropy, those kind of people who uh, take the initiative for on, on themselves, happen to know about information technology and going for genomics? Well, I mean, look what the Gates Foundation has done in terms of uh, funding a variety of different initiatives. So I think we see a lot more philanthropic dollars coming into things on the life sciences side. I don't think so on the digital IT side or, or green tech. Green tech will be more a subsidy driven economy or stimulus driven. But I'm not sure exactly what if you were asking something more specific. I think the most interesting case of that is I've seen a number of people investing or donating to life extension stuff. Uh, not just generally like Parkinson's, but uh, various ways of looking at, at, at mortality as a disease that you can just figure out a way to extend lifespans. Yeah. And more broadly, I do think you know, the, the eBay founders, obviously, um, um, Skoll Foundation and Omid Yara Foundation are, are, in a sense, yep. trying to apply the venture model to many of the world's problems, um, you know, more of a performance orientation. Uh, than, than perhaps has been present in philanthropy historically. I think that's, that's great. Mm -hmm. To be more specific for, for Matt, of course, uh, Bill Gates and, uh, and Sergey Brin and Andy Grove, they know exactly how to run a business. But there are many other aging population people with some very with us, like the Broad, Mr. and Mrs. Broad, who are lay people, very wealthy, but they don't know how to run a particular uh, genome-based economy business. They just donated 600 million for Broad Institute in Boston. Mm -hmm. So I think there might be a need for those well-endowed aging people who really want to not pay their taxes, which will be increased, but paying for venture philanthropy, and they don't know how to manage this kind of uh, 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 information technology and genomics businesses. So there is a niche for all of you who know exactly how to do this, to, do this, to pool these resources. Mm -hmm. Do you see this as a realistic opportunity? I, I don't know whether I think that, you know, I don't know how to pool the initiatives that you're mentioning. I think a lot of people uh, find their own way to sponsor fundamental science, whether it's university chairs or, you know, funding some large program at a university and things like that. I'm not sure how to institutionalize it at the level you're talking about. Uh, yeah, you have a question here. Um, I'm wondering, this topic is about, you started out talking about the best topic for this would be uh, when will the hangover end. And some of you seem very optimistic. Reed and Jay, you seem like you think this is a good time to invest. I'm wondering, what keeps you guys up at night right now? Are you mostly worried about the regular things you would be worried about in terms of your businesses and your portfolio? Or are you really worried about the downturn, and is that what you're concerned about with your businesses? 
I used to say my three kids keep me up at night. Yeah, but, but they've, got, about they've gotten the business, older. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, strangely, I guess um, it is more the macro picture. Um, the you know seemingly on last summer having been on the verge of the financial system melting down, the large spending going on. It just it really is uncharted territory, and so a lot of the worry is just trying to figure out how is it going to play out and how is it going to impact our world um, more than. Um, you know, the existing portfolio or other things. Yeah, I think the sorry, thing that keeps us up at night is whether, is this going to get better in a year or in five years? I mean, if it's five years, forget it. So you can't think about that. I mean, fundamentally, we have to be optimists in this business, um, guarded optimists in times like this. But the difference between things coming back in 12 months or even three years dramatically changes how you think about companies in the portfolio and how you operate them. And that, that differs by, by sector, by capital intensity, all those kind of things. So those are the things that you think about late at night. On you know, you know to, to, to amplify that, I'm, I'm actually very bullish on, on making new investments now. But I right. do think that, uh, to put a specific time frame, I think if this goes on, if we don't get any liquidity events, uh, I think 09 is okay. I think 10 is okay. I think if you go through 11 without liquidity events, uh, we get some really major shakeout in, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the venture capital category. And to the extent that we get a lot of shakeout in the category, it obviously hampers, you know, entrepreneurship and new company formation. So I, I, I agree with Jay uh, because a lot of things have to happen before um, the market for uh, growth, the I, growth IPOs has to happen. And, you know, among those things are, you know, uh, uh, stabilization, narrowing credit spreads, uh, and then the EBITDA-based companies actually starting to do well so the public investors can, you know, start making money. And then mo money has to flow out of treasuries and, and back, into, back into equities. And then a couple other things have to happen before it gets to, you know, early, before we get, you know, any liquidity, including, uh, you know, a growth, a secondary growth uh, um, offering has to happen in, in a technology company, all those things. And I think, you know, what, what I'm concerned about is how long does that take and does it happen, you know, soon enough. All right, and the other thing is for there to be a, a good M&A market, there has to be a credible IPO yeah, market. Right. So if all the buyers know that you can't go public, it depresses valuations. So until that happens. Just, just to throw something very different on this. I mean, I think fundamentally one of the things I like about entrepreneurship, Valley, what we're doing is it is optimistic and playing for the future. And one of the funny things that I think on the, the th in terms of things that keep me up at night is fundamentally, like we talk about optimism and pessimism here is the number of years that you're in recession, the opening of the markets. Uh, one of the questions that I asked a financial historian at Davos in January was, when has there been this much global economics turbulence and not a world war? And the, the optimistic answer was there aren't that many data points. The pessimistic answer is always, <laughs> right? So the actual, I think, the pessimistic thing that keeps me up at night is, is less the question of economic recovery and whatnot, because I think that will come as long as people are doing economics. What I'm more worried about is if you get the global tensions raised as much by as much economic turbulence as you have, there's a lot of areas in the world that are pretty unstable and what happens. So yeah. reads up more nights than me. <laughs> uh, last question, if that's okay. Uh, hi. Um, I have a question more related to probably all, but maybe a little bit more related to read seems to be like incubators are starting to be more popular in terms of deal flow. Uh, y Combinator and Sequoia, Matt, you mentioned today. And then there's Techstars um, in Colorado. And then there's Betaworks in the East Coast. Do you guys feel there's some shift or in terms of this recession, more of these incubators will come in and where you can kind of basically get more resources for the entrepreneurs? Or is it just a few really good ones that are out there right now? You know, I think the, the high-quality angel groups that are out there, like, like Reed, like I think Andreessen and Horowitz can be first-round guys like that, are still the ones to, to go to. I think they've got baseline. I think they've got the networks, the context to really be helpful to introduce you to the right venture capitalist, get the right people in the company, all those ingredients that, that make this work. I don't know, you know, some of the incubators are, give you a little bit of money and see what happens, but they don't have all the other things in the ecosystem that help nurture a company 
at the early stage and help them be successful. So there's a role for those, but I'm more skeptical of those than I am for some of the more prominent angels. I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think it's a surprisingly few number of angels that really kind of know what they're doing. Yeah. And, uh, and I think in this current environment, I think incubators, uh, for the most part, fall by the wayside uh, because, you know, the concept of we'll just throw, you know, throw some money together and we'll have some space and, and, and not adding a lot of value, I don't really think, I, I think that money uh, is one of the first to evaporate and I don't think it actually adds that much value, you know, in and of itself because the number of people who really know what they're doing is kind of few and far between. And those people, whether they have incubators or whether they just write personal checks, I think will be successful doing no matter what. And I think the, um, uh, the amateurs uh, who, who might have been doing that before, I think, are kind of out of it right now. So. Here's a structural problem with incubators, which is, uh, generally speaking, the whole notion of incubator is, oh, look, we make it all easier, we share these costs. Uh, you know, space, et cetera. But really, it's a whole question of how high of a mark can you shoot towards. And usually, that tends to be much more individual deals. So it's not that incubator models can never work or anything else, but it's generally a question of getting these spectacular upside deals, not kind of a base of shared costs and right. alleged right. synergies. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much you know, for all your time. It's, it's yeah. been great, and I've really enjoyed being here. Thanks, guys. Yeah. t-shirts. We hope cool. you wear them in good health. Thank you. And thank you Thanks. again to our sponsors, thank you. Cisco Systems, Fenwick and West, and Silicon Valley Bank. And thank you all for coming tonight. Good night.